over 100 military vehicles in this convoy. And it's been crossing this border for over three hours. When the last vehicle in this long line crosses that border, we will have met all requirements and removed all military service members from Iraq well before the December 31st deadline. According to the U.S.-Iraqi security agreement, uh, all of the U.S. troops uh, w must leave Iraq by the end of 2011, uh, and all of the U.S. bases must be shut down or handed over to the Iraqi side uh, by the same deadline, December 31st, 2011. In addition to this being a, a deadline included in the binding security agreement that was signed in 2008. Uh, this was also a part of President Obama's uh, own plan of withdrawal. He promised to abide by this deadline over and over again, uh, telling the U.S. and Iraqi public that he will get the last U.S. soldier out of Iraq before the end of 2011. This is a, a major historic uh, achievement, I think. Uh, for millions of Americans who have voiced their opposition to the Iraq War. Um, uh, it's an achievement for uh, Barack Obama, who promised to do, something, to do something like this in 2008, but has faced fierce bureaucratic opposition from the Pentagon and from some of his rivals for the uh, Democratic nomination. He is, Republican rivals. Um, it's not been an easy path. And uh, it's also, I think, a victory for sovereignty for the Iraqi people. You know, a few years ago, five or six years ago, the Iraqi parliament was against the U.S. military presence, while the Iraqi prime ministership was for it. And that, that uh, trend continues to exist in Iraq. In the U.S., there is a similar trend. Uh, while the uh, Obama White House was consist consistently against the uh, long-term military presence in Iraq. Uh, the Pentagon always gave statements contradicting with the White House's plan. Uh, actually, the Pentagon continues to attempt to leave uh, trainers in Iraq uh, or leave you know, thousands of troops and rename them as trainers. Uh, so uh, there are many attempts, including keeping these trainers under a NATO umbrella, uh, some other attempts uh, of giving them immunity according to an Iraqi executive order. Many, many attempts to continue the U.S. military involvement. Uh, but overall, I think the reason why the U.S. Uh, will end up withdrawing the last U.S. soldier from Iraq will happen because of a, a perfect storm. Uh, things that happened together at the same moment that led to the U.S. withdrawal. This include the Iraqi public pressure. Iraqis put so much pressure. They worked very hard. They elected parties that were against the occupation. They went in demonstrations. They signed petitions. They went on, uh, you know, uh, uh, speaking uh, tours. It's so much work inside Iraq just to uh, emphasize the importance of a complete withdrawal. And I think that ended up putting enough pressure on the government to abide by public opinion, uh, because the government knew that it will be a political suicide to go against uh, this tsunami, the Iraqi tsunami <laughs> of public opinion demanding uh, U.S. Uh, withdrawal. Since the beginning of the U.S. war, um, on Iraq in 2003, that one thing has been consistent from very shortly after we invaded up until um, today, there has been one consistent factor, which is the sentiment of Iraqis, regardless of how we choose to um, categorize them, has been unified in one area that they wished from the start for the U.S. to leave. 
Poll after poll has shown that approximately somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of Iraqis wanted the U.S. out. The problem that we have now is that the U.S. intervention is not only through the U.S. military, uh, through the D Department of Defense military, because unfortunately there are thousands of other U.S. personnel who are in Iraq under the State Department command. Um, the current plans for uh, the State Department uh, are to leave 16,000 personnel in Iraq after the end of 2011. Uh, these are very problematic, 16,000 personnel. Uh, this is as, as large as uh, an army division. It's a huge footprint. Uh, these 16,000 include 8,000 armed uh, security contractors, uh, armed mercenaries, uh, another four or five thousand uh, so-called lifeline contractors, you know, the contractors who uh, cook and uh, wash dishes and whatever. And the rest are employees uh, in five different uh, sites that the State Department will maintain in Iraq. And this includes the huge um, embassy in the Green Zone, the largest embassy in the history of humankind. Um, and it includes two consulates and two uh, diplomatic missions uh, spread around the country. Uh, there are other uh, sites as well, uh, some airport sites, some police training sites. It's a massive mission. I don't think it is um, a mission that is appropriate for a diplomatic mission. It's uh, unparalleled. Uh, there is no equivalent of this uh, mission in the world. I mean, uh, just look at the size of the Iraqi diplomatic mission in Washington, D.C., and compare it to the size of the U.S. diplomatic mission in Iraq. It's unbelievable. It's very disproportionate. Some people on the uh, uh, the depressed left, I would call it, uh, and the, their depression is legitimate, who just can't believe that we're getting out of Iraq. And I could be proved wrong, but I, I try in my work, my research, my writing, to stay with the facts that I know. Um, I'm not Donald Rumsfeld. I, I don't involve myself in the unknowable knowables and all that stuff. The, what we know is that the, um, uh, the president has agreed uh, uh, to a total pullout of troops. What we further know is that 170 Americans will be left to guard the embassy, soldiers, and that somewhere between five and 15,000 uh, um, private contractors will be there. Um, I don't think uh, we're entirely clear, but it seems very unlikely that there'll be a base. I think there will be ongoing negotiations about the, the bilateral relationship after the troops leave. It'll be sovereign state to sovereign state. So who knows? Um, some people think the whole issue, the, the whole moral issue apparently, is whether zero Americans are left in Iraq with zero capabilities. Well, uh, I, I would advise them to pay attention to that, but not make it the only issue. There, there are Americans in Moscow. There are Americans on bases in the Philippines. There are, it's, it's not unusual to leave a very large contingent after a war. Look at the Americans in Germany and in Japan. They shouldn't be there. But, but do we really think Germany is a vassal state, a subordinate state to the United States because we have a base there? So I think in general um, the war is over and people have a hard time dealing with that and they're, uh, they're, they're perhaps um, uh, a little too paranoid about whether 
whether there'll be zero Americans remaining. I think the fact that we have pulled out the vast majority of our troops from Iraq and really left this more of a small, more agile presence in the country is, is really to the benefit of the U.S. because um, it's, it's an occupation without an occupation. It's control without a huge um, cost to us. And we are able to more easily influence policy without all of the negativity and, um, of, of having an actual military force in the country or a large military force in the country. But I do not believe the fact that we pulled out um, the vast majority of, of our troops, um, of our military presence necessarily means that we have ceased to occupy the country. Um, I believe that we are still very much in control of Iraqi policy. Um, I believe we are very much in control of what Iraq does and does not do, and of its, its everyday government, um, of its people. In the U.S., I think there was a, a lot of public pressure here. Uh, this, we shouldn't forget that one of the main reasons why President Obama was elected was his, actually, was his positions on Iraq. Uh, that was a very clear factor why he uh, won over Hillary Clinton in the um, primary elections, and it was a factor in why he won the, the general elections as well. So that was an important thing. In addition to that, of course, the, the U.S. economic situation played a role in the final decision. I think if uh, the U.S. economic situation was better, uh, maybe there would have been more attempts to continue the occupation. Uh, but the U.S. government found itself in a place where it cannot afford continuing the very expensive occupation uh, of Iraq. The other remnant of the U.S. occupation of Iraq is, of course, the largest embassy um, in the world, the largest U.S. embassy in the world, the largest embassy of any country ever built in the history of man um, remains in Iraq. That embassy in and of itself is a huge presence. Um, it has roughly 8,000 um, employees it has and, and all the support that they need. Um, and it is really um, more or less viewed as um, the U.S. Uh, command, really, of the Iraqi government. Um, that it is symbolic of the fact that the U.S. still, to a very large extent, um, controls what happens in Iraq and um, that the Iraqi government really is not sovereign, is not independent, and that Iraq itself is not a sovereign and independent country. Here in the U.S. there is a controversy as well because the State Department's own Inspector General, the Office of Inspector General, in 2009 put out a report uh, with recommendations on the way forward. And now this report, of course, was in, li in light of the uh, bilateral agreement with Iraq that requi requested or uh, required all the U.S. troops to leave the country. The Office of Inspector General recommended two major things. Uh, the first one was ending all of the PRTs, the uh, Provisional uh, Reconstruction Teams, that were uh, doing you know, some reconstruction, failed reconstruction projects around the country, which was a very good decision because they were wasteful and not fruitful at all. The second recommendation in 2009 was what the report called right-sizing the embassy. Uh, this is the way that the report called downsizing the embassy. It talked about how the embassy is overstaffed, it has thousands of employees, they don't need to have all of these employees to uh, conduct the missions that they uh, are expected to conduct, and that they have to downsize the mission. Uh, unfortunately, the State Department ignored its own Office of Inspector General's uh, recommendations and not only continued to operate with the same size of an embassy but doubled it. They went from 8,000 to 16,000. It's extremely controversial, very uh, risky and very expensive for us, for US taxpayers, to continue paying for the presence of these 16,000 personnel in Iraq. It will cost US taxpayers uh, tens of billions of dollars a year and I think it will continue to harm uh, the U.S. image in Iraq and in the rest of the world. And it might even harm President Obama's image because people will, uh, will think that he's trying to um, send uh, you know, troops or contractors 
through the back door, uh, trying to pull a trick uh, on Iran. It's harder to end a war than begin one. Indeed, everything that American troops have done in Iraq, all the fighting and all the dying, the bleeding and the building and the training and the partnering, all of it has led to this moment of success. Now, Iraq's not a perfect place. It has many challenges ahead. But we're leaving behind a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq with a representative government that was elected by its people. We're building a new partnership between our nations. And we are ending a war, not with a final battle, but with a final march toward home. Well, you know, just a couple of other things he does. Uh, first of all, he has expanded his fighting overtly six Muslim countries, not only two. He has added Pakistan. He has added um, Yemen, Somalia. He has added Libya. So um, he's expanding. Uh, point two. He has changed from Pentagon to CAA. The warfare is more secret than it used to be. And we know for sure that he's fighting in a lot of other Islamic countries, but not in any declared way. So he's using, of course, drones, according to CAA data and coordinates. In other words, um, may very well be that troops in the traditional sense, the kind of troops that break through doors and terrorize frightened to death families and shoot a couple of them and interrogate some others, and that will probably decline. Um, in a sense, he has already exited because those drones are to a large extent controlled from Washington. Incidentally, by women soldiers who don't like direct combat. Now with drones and sitting in front of a computer and plugging in some coordinates, they escape from the emotional troubles they otherwise might have had. So you can say that if he exits in the classical sense and you have troops returning home, that doesn't mean the stop to the warfare, because the warfare has already exited. So that's one thing, and it says a lot about Obama. He is a liar and a hypocrite. And not one single word he says should ever be taken seriously, because it probably means just the opposite. It's just the rhetoric can can say, veil drawn over the facts. The U.S. Um, in pulling out the troops has had to put um, somewhat of a positive spin on on what the last nine years have meant in Iraq and. The, the fact that the dictator was removed, of course, is, is, is billed as a positive development. The fact that Iraq has had elections is, is billed as the implementation of democracy in the country. And there has really been very little um, said about the destruction that has been brought to the country. The infrastructure of Iraq has been completely destroyed. The education system has been destroyed, the healthcare system has been destroyed, roads, bridges, hospitals, um, the electrical grid, um, water purification, all of those things are not what they were nine years ago. All of those things have declined. So when you look at it in, in those terms, in terms of what the U.S. adventure in Iraq has meant to the people of Iraq, by no stretch of the imagination can it be viewed as a positive thing, what we have done to that country. The fact of the matter is that the vast majority of Iraqis are receiving a substandard education, an education that is by no means um, on the level that it was before we went in. 
Approximately 80% of Iraqis don't have regular, consistent access to electricity or to clean drinking water. That was not the case before we went in. Iraq was a functioning country. It had a, um, a vibrant economy. It had a vibrant culture. It had one of the best educational systems in the region. And all of those things are gone. Beyond that, beyond the destruction to the infrastructure of Iraq, what you have um, is the destruction of, of an entire generation. I think, I think economic issues are among the, the, mo the, the most important priorities for the decision makers that started this war. Economic issues have been on the top of the list of the reasons why the U.S. went to war in Iraq to start with. The U.S. chose to invade Iraq, not a poor nation with no oil, because of Iraq's natural resources, because of Iraq's power in the region, and other, of course, other geopolitical reasons. But the, the last eight years, I think, there was a massive failure in investing Iraq's wealth. The U.S. spent around a trillion dollars Iraq spent another trillion dollars. It, it went all wasted. Uh, Iraq is still a country that does not have basic services. There is no electricity or water uh, or, or uh, you know, education or the very basic services that Iraq used to provide to its citizens uh, are lacking uh, these days. So, but one of the reasons that why, why the U.S. went to Iraq was definitely to, to attempt controlling Iraq's oil, to attempt controlling who has access to Iraq's oil. What do we know about oil? Well, we know that um, the Iraqis want to um, sell their oil to consumers. They don't want to drink their oil. Uh, we also know that the, uh, the group of uh, establishment wise men convened uh, in 2007 to, to find a face-saving way out of Iraq, uh, known as the Baker-Hamilton Group, uh, Baker being the baker of the oil industry and the Republican establishment. Um, it's not hard to understand what they're talking about. Uh, quote, the United States should encourage investment in Iraq's oil sector by the international community and by international energy companies. The United States should assist Iraqi leaders to reorganize the national oil industry as a commercial enterprise, and so on and so on and so on. So that was uh, part of the agenda. Um, I don't think it drove the agenda, but I think it was part of the agenda. And the, um, the Western oil companies are back bidding, but as to the actual law that the Bush administration and the neocons were pushing with all their might, uh, it, it's never passed the Iraqi parliament. It's, it remains paralyzed in uh, disputes, I think, over the, the, the control of it, first of all, and the royalties. So uh, I, I think it would be a big mistake uh, to have a kind of dour conclusion that the oil companies won. With regard to Iraqi oil, which I don't believe any serious person can deny was a major motivating factor in our decision to invade and occupy Iraq, time will tell what benefit U.S. corporations will reap from, from our occupation of Iraq. But the fact of the matter is that the U.S. has absolutely pushed for and gained um, the Iraqi change in position in terms of its view of its oil. So there has been this pressure on the Iraqi government to commercialize the oil industry more and more, to permit Western oil companies, energy companies, to um, obtain contracts for the long-term control of Iraqi oil. But more sadly is the fact that there has been such a level of corruption inserted into the oil industry in Iraq to the point where the vast majority of Iraqis are not seeing the benefit of their wealth. 
So as far as I'm concerned, I'm done. This war is over. I wish everybody well uh, because I drive a car too and I hope that Iraq will find uh, uh, other sources of revenue than international oil markets but I, I think we knew from the beginning that s somebody was going to get the oil and the question was the control and how much the Iraqis were going to get out of it and the war did not uh, settle that question. To paraphrase Ronald Reagan, if Iraqis were asked, are you better off today than you were in 2003 prior to the US invasion and occupation, the vast majority of Iraqis would say no, they are not better off today. That is not because they are not happy to be rid of Saddam Hussein. That is not it at all. It is because what replaced Saddam Hussein was not a thoughtful um, strategy or implementation of democratic rule. What replaced Saddam Hussein has been, to a large extent, anarchy. So it's a shaky country. Uh, but um, there won't be uh, divisions imposed or instigated from the outside. I think that's in favor of uh, Iraqi sovereignty. Yes, the uh, Iranians will be on the side of the Shia. Yes, the Saudis will be on the side of the Sunnis. Uh, I don't know where the Americans would be. I thought we were friends of the Saudis because of oil. But we installed an anti-Saudi regime. I thought we were enemies of Iran. But we installed a pro-Iran regime. You figure. This is part of the lessons of the war, the craziness of the logic of the war, that we have to engage in discussing and debating in the days ahead. But I think uh, the, the stabilizing of Iraq and the healing of Iraq is something that uh, most Americans can agree on, most the NATO countries can agree on, most of the uh, countries in the Middle East uh, may want to play a role.